All right, guys. Well, I am so excited about this week's podcast. I have a very special friend of mine who is one of my two favorite Canadians. I don't know very many Canadians personally, but this gentleman is amazing. He is a wonderful Bible teacher, and I have gotten to know him a little bit, and I consider him a great friend. Um, he is a, He's just a great asset to our school, and I've just been very blessed to know him. I want to introduce my friend, Mike Morris. Mike, I appreciate you coming on our podcast this week. Oh, thanks, Matt. I'm, I'm certainly glad to be here, and, and and I'm especially excited with the topic we're talking about because it's just it, it's so applicable to the day and age we live in, and uh, and sort of with what's going on right now in the Middle East and in Eastern Europe. So it's a, it's exciting to talk about for sure. Well, absolutely. Well, like I said, I, you know, I had somebody reach out on our Facebook page and um, our ever growing Facebook page of Creation and Compost, and somebody asked me. They said, "Can you make a video?" And as much as I love eschatology, you know, I love end times prophecy, I'm just, I'm just, I do not believe I have the background and I've not spent the time uh, studying this. I, you know, my passion is really the message of creation, but I want to learn more about this. So I thought, sure. you know, we need to bring somebody in who, you know, this is, this is what they do. So uh, again, this is just how God blesses, you know, the fact that we're at the same school together. And I do consider you to be an amazing resource in this. So um, I really, again, I appreciate you, you know, agreeing to be on our show and uh, do pray that folks can take this and they can really not just look at events, but they can actually look to scripture. And that's what Amen. of course we, we want everybody yeah. to do. So, uh, that's right. we, so are we ready to go? Let's go. Awesome. So there's a lot that's, you know, occurred in the last week or so that involved Russia, Ukraine, and definitely a lot of the European countries. A lot of people, both believers and non-believers alike, have expressed a lot of interest in how this relates to not only end-time prophecy, yeah. but what this means for their daily lives. So yeah. I guess one of the things I'd like to know is how does this relate to end-time prophecies? And are there any specific countries, like is Russia mentioned yeah. in Scripture? Yeah. And are there other countries that are associated associated with Russia in the scriptures? Well, uh, first of all, I'll say this. I, I think when people make the correlation, you know, the Bible says in Matthew 24, there's going to, one of the ways we can know we're getting close to the end is wars and rumors of wars, right? That's one of the things it says in Matthew 24. But there's always been wars. There's always been rumors of wars. So, you know, we have to be careful of not being alarmist. Or not being or not sensationalizing everything because in our modern day uh, world that we live in with all the conspiracy theories, we want to sensationalize everything, and and we have to be careful as Christians not to make you know a, 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 a mountain of a molehill. But but I will say this: what's going on right now in Ukraine with Russia is especially interesting to me, Matt. It, it, you know, it, give me an example. Last week, for the last few weeks, of course, I'm Canadian. You know, the whole world was talking with this Canadian trucker. Uh, boycott that we had in Canada and we had thousands of big rigs, you know, in, in our capital of Ottawa and they were protesting mask mandates, all sort of stuff. And the world was watching and the world was interested and so was I. But honestly, nowhere in scripture, uh, the, in biblical prophecy, does the Bible ever mention Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, or trucker strikes or protests. So I look at that and I find it interesting, especially as a Canadian, but there's nothing prophetic necessarily about that. However, when you bring Russia into play, that is fascinating because when you go to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and I, and I challenge anyone who's watching this video, you know, to go read Ezekiel 38 and 39, because it talks about this end times war between with involving this country called Magog. So people often call it the battle of Gog and Magog, but Gog is just a word the Bible uses for the leader of this nation or this group of peoples called Magog. Hmm. And when you look at a map, this great nation of Magog is going to be directly north of Israel. Well, if you look at a map, it's, it's surprising to some people how close Russia actually is to, to Israel. So is the word Russia used in the Bible? No. But if we look at some of the ancient words for some of these countries, you know, for example, Iran, you know, right up till I think the 1930s or so was called Persian, right? Um, but now it's called Iran. Um, so, so I think we can say pretty confidently as, as theologians that, you know, probably Russia is what's referred to as Magog. 
So whenever you see Russia getting involved in a conflict, as, as, as a student of eschatology, you kind of go, whoa, okay, that, that's a little bit different. That, that's different than the Canadian trucker thing. I mean, this is some of the players involved in end times prophecy. Now, right now, they're in Ukraine. I mean, they're, they're not attacking Israel. Uh, Israel's not involved in this. But whenever you see Magog, if you will, or Russia involved, it kind of makes you perk up a little bit. And the Bible is really clear that as Christians, you know, we're to always be looking. Like, we should not be shocked when Jesus Christ returns. You know, regardless of your eschatological beliefs. You know, I, I'm a, so just so everyone watching understands this, I am a very strong, typical, futuristic the book of Revelation refers to what's happening in the future. I'm a very typical um, pre-tribulation person. I believe in a rapture of the church. But, but I want to make this really clear. Um, this is not an essential doctrine issue, mm -hmm. right? So, so I have brothers, and I say that in the faith, who are preterists or partial preterists, I should say, um, who believe in a post-tribulational, the mid-tribulational rapture or a pre-wrath rapture. And we're all brothers, and, and we can have that, that um, uh, in-family discussion. You know, we're not talking about salvation by grace alone, grace alone through faith alone, and Christ alone. We're, we're not even talking about, um, you know, the triune or the trinity of God. You know, we, we are talking about something that's going to happen in the future. But, but that being said, Matt, we all believe this. He's coming back. Amen. Whether we agree the timing of it or how it's going to look, the bottom line is he is coming back and we're told to watch. And so when you see one of the players outlined in Ezekiel and outlined in Daniel, outlined in the book of Revelation coming into play uh, militarily, that's interesting. Absolutely. That's interesting. Absolutely. Well, and I know too, just, you know, for the last few years, Russia, you know, it seems like every news story that was related to our previous administration here in the U.S., Russia seemed to be just on every reporter, every politician's tongue. It was like yeah. you, you almost could not hear a story without hearing the name Russia. And, um, you know, some people, you know, act like they're surprised by what's happened in the last week. But for most of us who at least keep up with the news to, uh, you know, a, a minute degree, you know, this is something that obviously Putin has, um, has definitely been saying on a large scale since last July that yeah. was imminent and it was just a matter of time. Yeah. Um, are there specific events that as you talk about Russia in the end times, are there uh, specific events about them reclaiming their status as a threat to world sovereignty aside from um, as far as Israel, are there other countries that come into play? Are there other events that people could possibly look at as um, maybe an, I don't want to say a sign, but maybe another indicator that, that end of time is getting closer and closer. Well, well sure. There, 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 there's a lot of interesting factors. And, and to me, eschatology is kind of like a puzzle, right? Mm -hmm. And, and you're, you're, you're reading the book of Revelation, and then you're reading the books of Ezekiel and Daniel and, 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 and the teachings of Jesus and Paul and Thessalonians, and you're putting all these different puzzle pieces together. Matt, there's so many things going on in the world right now. And I'm sure that every generation before us thought, you know, the coming of I'm sure if you were living during World War II, you were thinking Hitler's the Antichrist and Christ on his way. But that's a good way to think. Mm -hmm. we, we, the Bible says we're not to be caught off guard. We, we, we right. are to have our, you know, the Bible gives the, the Jesus gave the parable of the 10 virgins, mm -hmm. you know, who, who, who some of them had their vials filled with oil and some didn't have their vials full of oil. They, they weren't prepared. They weren't ready. And one thing I can say about my eschatology, um, I'm not going to be surprised when Christ returns. But Matt, I do find this interesting. Right now, when you look at who Russia is in alliance with, hmm. they are in alliance with Iran, who is, who is Persia of the Bible. Um, that's interesting because Iran has numerous times threatened to destroy Israel, right? Mm -hmm. and, and understand what we don't know about this battle of Gog and Magog we spoke of. There's a lot of disagreement among theologians. You know, when is it? You know, right. some people put it, you know, before the tribulation period. Some people put it in between the rapture of the church in the beginning of the tribulation period. You know, mo like I'm, I'm one who kind of believes that when the rapture occurs, tribulation is going to happen kind of right away. Sure. But we're not sure about that. I mean, there might be a little gap of time. And some people put the battle of Gog and Magog in almost the same time as the second coming of Christ and the battle of Armageddon. So they would put it at the end of the seven years. That all being said, I don't know. Uh, right. and, and honestly, I think anyone who's dogmatic about the timing of the Gog-Magog rapture, I, I don't know how that's something you can be dogmatic about. 
we just know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. But, but Matt, also look at who else they're in alignment with Russia. I mean, um, they're in alignment with China. Mm-hmm. Now, this is fascinating. The Bible tells us there's going to be a 200 million man army come against the East, the Battle of Armageddon, and they're going to go against Israel. And we also, the armies of the North are going to come down against Israel. And for years, we kind of laughed at that, like, who can ever have an army of 200 million men? How is that possible? Yeah. But when you look at east of Israel, what major country is east of Israel? Well, China. And they're an alliance right now with Syria, who hates Israel, and with Russia, who is north of Israel. And not to mention Pakistan and India and these other countries that are east of Israel. And this is fascinating. In Afghanistan, when Americans take control of Afghanistan, um, that is kind of a corridor, if you will, into the Middle East. Well, right now, where Afghan is not under American control, if you want to get a 200 million man army to come from the east, I mean, you, you have an open door there now, yeah. right? I mean, you could come through that corridor now without any kind of American resistance to it because they're, they're, they're coming, um, you know, through that, through that way. And the Bible also talks about how the Euphrates River is going to be dried up so that these armies from the east can come across the dried up Euphrates River to attack Israel. Mm-hmm. Well, right now, and you do a YouTube search on this or a Google search, Euphrates River is drying up. ISIS mm-hmm. soldiers are literally running back and forth across the dried up Euphrates River in some parts mm-hmm. um, to, to, to do some of their, some of their deeds. Um, so we just see a lot of puzzle pieces, you know, starting to click and come together. And, yeah. and Matt, it's, it's a, and for me, as someone who strongly believes in pre-tribulational rapture of the church, I get excited because yeah. when I see all this stuff that happens, the Bible says, when you see all this stuff that happen, look up. Oh, and Matt, if I can, I'm, I'm sorry, I know I'm talking a lot here, no, but no, if no. I can just share this, this, this is the part that's most exciting to me. This is the part that's most exciting to me. In 1947, Matt, what major thing happened that was a key for world events today? Was it that the establishment of Israel as a state? Yes. Yeah. Yes. When Israel became a country in 47 or 48, whatever, you know, people differ on years. Or, but but w- when Israel became a country, Matt, think about this. In Ezekiel 38, it makes it very clear that Israel will be dispersed. Well, Israel wasn't a country for 2,000 years. There, there was Jews living in Poland, there was Jews in Czechoslovakia, there were Jews in Canada, there were Jews in Great Britain and America, there were Jews all over the world, but there's no Israel. For 2,000 years since 70 AD, it, Israel was not a country. Mm. And then in 1948, it became a country again. Yeah. And now, to me, that is what started the prophetic clock. That started the prophetic clock where now we see all this stuff coming together in the book of Revelation. We're like, wow, maybe we are living in these last days think about how amazing is israel became a country again any country that's ever can you ever think of a country that's been militarily defeated and their people scattered throughout the world have they ever become a country again mm. ever mm. did you think the seminole indians in florida will ever get their land back no. do you think the micmac indians and, and the malice indians in eastern canada will ever get their own nation back no. i mean it, it's never going to happen mm-hmm. but israel somehow Miraculously, just like the Bible predicted, became a country again. And they are a country. And now, and why does everyone hate Israel? This little tiny country the size of New Jersey, why does everyone care so much about them? But Iran wants them blown off the map. Syria, you know, wants them blown off the map. I, I mean, Russia has problems with them. I mean, it's just amazing that all, again, puzzle pieces, they're all coming together. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't live, and I know neither one of us lived during that time of World War II, but, you know, to me, reading the accounts, and like you mentioned about Hitler, a lot of people considered him to be the Antichrist, and sure. because and he was so close to conquering that entire side of the mm-hmm. globe. Um, you know, it is amazing, living during that time, I would love to even hear people's firsthand accounts for those that are still around, because, of course, those populations are, are you know, dwindling yeah. down. Um, but you, a- you actually answered one of my next questions in terms of, could this encourage other major countries to invade other countries, smaller countries? And I know you talked yeah. about China, and right now there's a lot of debate as to whether or not they'll go into Taiwan. But then mm-hmm. you mentioned about the U.S. 
um, withdrawal from Afghanistan and we see what happened, ISIS pretty much took that over immediately. And yeah. of course, you know, not trying to get political, we left a ton of weapons and a lot of money. Right, and it, a lot it of is gear. what it is. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, but that does give additional firepower, both literally and figuratively, for these countries to make their way towards that little bitty place you mentioned, the size of about New Jersey. Yeah. That to me is remarkable that they're even still here almost I know. 80, 80 years after they were reestablished as a country. Yeah. Um, so let me ask you this question, and you've kind of alluded to a little bit. How does the U.S. factor into end times prophecy? I know you mentioned about Canada, Ottawa not being a part. Yeah. Is, there, is there any chance that the United States will be a part of end time prophecy? Interesting. A couple theories here, Matt, and, and um, I'm not dogmatic about this either. There's some people that say that America is just not mentioned in the prophecy. They're just, they're just not even mentioned. And that tells a lot of people that there has to be a reason because right now, and I forget the name of the website I was looking at, Matt, but I was looking at this website the other day, and it was listing the three most powerful nations on the world map right now in terms of military. And not just in terms of number of soldiers or number of tanks, but everything from modern day technology to sophistication to leadership and everything. And it ranked um, it ranked uh, uh, USA one, it ranked Russia two and China three. And I think we all probably agree on that more or less, right? Yeah. But if America is ranked one on that list, um, why aren't they mentioned in times prophecy? Well, there's a couple of reasons. Some people think that when the rapture occurs, um, and there's, there's a lot of Christians living in America, and of course, but we know the book of Revelation is very clear that there will be people in heaven from every race, tribe, and nation around the world. But there is a lot of Christians in America that the rapture um, is so going to uh, disorient people here that we're just going to leadership wise, we're just going to kind of crumble from within um, and, and we're just not going to be a factor in the end stage. That, that, that's one theory. Some people think it, it's very possible we're neutralized because of a natural disaster, maybe Yellowstone blows up, or maybe, you know, who knows, a tsunami from the east or west coast um, happens, and we're, 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 we're done that way. Um, maybe it's militarily. Maybe, maybe there's a, a nuclear holocaust. You know, maybe, you know, a, 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 a Russian submarine comes in off the uh, east coast and, you know, lets us have it, and it may, maybe that's what happens. And, in fact, you know, one of the, the theories that I have and again, this is only a theory, sure. but people say, well, when the rapture of the church occurs and people are taken, how are they going to explain this away? I mean, and, and could it be, Matt, and I'm just, uh, this, the Bible doesn't say this is me thinking a little bit. Could the bombs be coming down as we're kind of going up? <laughs> you know what I mean? That's so that's one theory. I've, never, uh, but I've never thought of that. Yeah. So so basically the bombs coming down, we're going up and the world thinks, wow, I mean, because the Bible talks about and I forget which seal judgment is, but I, I think a third of the world is destroyed by fire. Mm. And it, it sure sounds if you read it like the book of Revelation that it could potentially. In fact, I think it's Ezekiel um, talks about how men's faces will melt and their eyes will melt in their sockets. You know, that kind of sounds like it could be potentially, you know, nuclear holocaust. And mm -hmm. here's what's interesting, Matt. You know, man doesn't build weapons that they don't use. Has man ever built a weapon they haven't used? No. Nope. I mean, the, the, you, you build a shotgun so you can go shoot a partridge. That's a Canadian bird. Um, <laughs> or a turkey. I, 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 mean? I, I appreciate the, uh, the the key that you're providing me. I'm just well, a little – I'm a simple-minded South Georgia boy, but but I we're, we're on the same page. But you don't have partridges down here, right? Well, we we have quail, we have dove, we have pheasants. We it's have like a turkey, quail. So, it's like a yeah. pheasant. Yeah. Quail, yeah, okay. But, but you build shotguns for a reason. You build – you build swords for a reason. Man has always built weapons, and we've always used what we built. So I, I think we're a little naive to think at some point someone's not going to do something that we don't really want them to do. And, you know, could it be, you know, they're coming down, we're going up in the mass chaos. It's just, you know, they're dead. They're gone. You know, and that's just me, um, you know, kind of thinking out loud. Um, but, yeah, so so in another theory is um, in, in uh, Revelation, I believe it's 18, there's a great city called Babylon the Great. Hmm. And Babylon the Great is this great city that the whole world buys its goods from. And the whole world, it sits on many waters. And basically, it's destroyed in one hour. And there's a lot of Christians um, who believe that Babylon the Great in Revelation chapter 18 is actually referring to America. 
And that America, and if you go, if you go and read, and I challenge people to do this, you go read Revelation 18. It sounds like America because it talks about these sins and these sexual perversions that are coming out of this, this great city um, and how the whole world got wealthy. The merchants of the world got wealthy because of the luxuries that this city had. Well, who, who buys the world's goods? Us. Who buys all this stuff from China and, and Mexico and from Indonesia and from, you know, wherever? Americans, we do. I mean, think about it, Matt. We, we, we have more luxuries. People who live in apartment buildings in America have more luxuries than the kings of the 1600s, 1700s. I, I mean, we do. We, we have more luxuries. I mean, we have running water and hot water, and the air conditioning goes in our car. We think we're going to lose our mind. We're not going to even survive. You know, the Seminole Indians lived for hundreds and hundreds of years without, without air conditioning, but we can't live for more than five seconds without it. So it, it, it almost looks like um, Revelation 18 could be referring to America, and the Bible says that that, that city, whatever that city is, um, it's destroyed, the Bible says, in one hour. Mm. And going back to the nuclear thing, how do you destroy a city in one hour? So I think for a lot of time, and I think Revelation is progressive, if you're reading that back in the 12, 13, 1400s, I think there's no way you can destroy a city in one hour. Nobody can destroy a whole city, a big city, in one hour. Well, yeah, you can. They wouldn't have known that back then, but we know that today. That is, you know, one nuclear bomb and... The city is gone. You go look at old pictures of Nagasaki and um, uh, help me out here. Uh, Hiroshima. Hiroshima. I mean, those they were leveled. I mean, you look at old pictures. I mean, those were leveled. And so is it possible? So again, there, there's differing opinions in Christianity of what Babylon um, the Great is in Revelation 18. And I'm not sure myself. I'm not, I'm not dogmatic that it's America. I'm, I'm certainly not dogmatic. It could be a future city yet to be built. Um, a lot of Christian theologians believe that. And they could be right. Um, but when you read Revelation 18, I can see why people do think it could be America because it does sound like it. Yeah. Well, I think you made a really good point, too. A, a lot of people have a misconception that Christianity is a Western religion when, in fact, it's actually the most successful Asian um, and yeah. Middle Eastern missionary religion, so to speak, Absolutely. because it all yeah. started there. Amen. It's just the United States itself has become, I believe, its its prominent status has been achieved because of the fact that this country yeah. was indeed uh, generated by people who believed. They might not have all been, you know, Baptist or Methodist or whatever. You had a variety yeah. of beliefs, but there was that central idea that there was a God that we are to answer to, a creator God. And that's, sure. part, of, and that's part of what I really find fascinating is you know, we're almost coming full circle when we think about um, how far we have gone where, you know, we've taken prayer out of schools. Well, not in Christian schools, not all of them, I hope, um, but yeah. in public schools. And, you know, of course, now we see such a rise of secularism that has made its way into Christian and homeschool education. Oh, which, absolutely. Again, the initial purpose of education was for the parents to have that responsibility. And we've seen people protest in public school arenas where, you know, they're fighting this. But I believe that in itself, too, as uh, I had a student actually was reading from Second Peter 3, where it talks about in the, the last days, in the end times, people walking after their own lust, people yeah. scoffing at the Bible. And, and the reason they do yeah. it is because they're willingly ignorant. And I heard right. an evangelist one time, he actually said in the Greek, that means dumb on purpose. Um, but, you know, kind of thinking about Christians. What can we do with the current conflicts? What are things that Christians can do to become more educated, more involved, yeah. and more proactive in, in what's going on? Well, well, look, this is what I've got to be careful. This is what I struggle with, Matt, and I really struggle with this. Um, I am a conservative with a capital C, right? So Amen. fiscally, uh, in terms of all the social things, you know, abortion, you name it, I'm conservative with a capital C but I'm a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ first. Amen. Amen. And what I have to be careful of is I can get so wrapped up in some of these social issues and, um, and, and, and they're good issues and they're issues. You know, what angers God should anger us. And I get that. But the most important thing we can do as Christians is not convince people that abortion is wrong or not teach people that fornication or adultery is wrong or not teach people that same-sex marriage is wrong, 
the number one thing that we ought to be doing as Christians is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with people. Because the Bible says that outside of Jesus Christ, no one gets a father. The Bible says, except through the son. The Bible says the road to heaven is narrow and broad is the way to describe broad is the way of destruction. So the reality is that most people, this, this sounds terrible, but it's just what the Bible says are going to end up in eternity of damnation. They're mm -hmm. going to end up in a place that the Bible calls Hades or Sheol or hell or whatever you want to call it, but it's not good. And mm -hmm. our number one priority should be sharing who Jesus Christ is. And, and yes, I want to convince people that we're right about some of these political issues or some of these uh, social issues, but ultimately we have to keep focused, laser focused on who is Jesus in, in, in telling people who he is and having people come to faith in the gospel because ultimately that's what's going to matter. And I got to be careful. I got to constantly remind myself, you know, when I'm talking to people that I disagree with, I got to make sure I keep my testimony because I want to show them that I care about them. I love them and I love them enough that, I, that I'm willing to share who Jesus is with them. And I don't always do a great job of that, unfortunately. Um, but I think that's the key to answer that question. Well, brother, you join the club because we all, as the Book of Romans says, and I know, I know that's what a lot of people use is that introduction to um, as far as we all have fallen short of the glory of God, that there is none righteous, no, not one. Yep. And I'll just go ahead and tell you a daily struggle for me many times a day is just trying to remind myself that, again, I was I belong to Christ before I belong yep. to the United States before yes. I belong to a political yeah. party. Um, and, and I want to throw this in there because I do pray that this doesn't alienate some people who may not agree on a political spectrum. But, you know, there is a lot of division, not just in other countries, but in America, there's a big division between political parties, the media, and just the common average person. As you were talking about the convoys in Canada, we now have a trucker convoy that's making its way to Washington, D.C. So obviously there's going to be some disruptions in our economy and the distribution of goods in the next few weeks here as well. So there's going to be a lot of unrest, political and social and yeah. everything else. But I'll tell you, the last few years, I believe our country, because under the previous administration prior to what we have now, there was a lot of free speech that was allowed that many people were so scared of it being taken away. But in the last year and a half, we've actually seen the complete opposite in our country to where social media and big tech has actually outlawed a lot of yeah. speech. But it's, it's, it's due to a small group of people who have gotten control of our lives. And somebody, yeah. may, somebody may hear this podcast and decide that they want to take it down. And I pray that that doesn't happen. But for the time that we have left, that's what I really feel like God has called me into. And I'm trying to use the gift of gab to be productive yeah. because I want to bring people on that have passions that God has called into certain ministries. And I really do believe this is something that he's called you into, not yeah. trying to be prophet, but it's obviously something that is very passionate to you. Yeah. And I really feel like you've made it very clear about where your heart is. And I hope that when people hear this, I do hope that they're seeing this is somebody that just, you know, if they know, if they get any representation of you like I do, I'm like, this guy is super humble. He's amazing in being able to talk to, but definitely very educated and passionate about this issue. And I Matt, guess- Matt, can, 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 yeah. I, can I just, I just want to say this one last thing, if I, if I can just say this. Absolutely. And I hope anybody watching, and I hope you get this for our message. A lot of times people look at Christians and they, they have this mindset that you think, you're better than us and you're better than me because we say things like having sex before marriage is sin. We say that uh, homosexuality is sin and we say adultery is sin. You think you're better than me. Can I show anyone out here is watching? I I'm not better than any of you out there. Watch. I I'm not better than any. I, I, I am a sinner. I, I, I am a sinner. And I know when people look at me, they, they probably think, you know, Michael Morris is a good guy and a good father and he's showing up for work on time every day. Folks, I, I am a sinner, and I know my heart, I know my thought processes, I know my lack of self-control at times, but the only reason that I know that I am saved and born again and redeemed is because of what Jesus Christ has done. Thank Jesus you. died for my sin, and, and, and if it weren't for his grace and his mercy, then, then I would be in hell for all of eternity because that's what I honestly deserve. So please understand, I, I am not better than anybody. And I encourage you folks, I encourage everyone out there, do me a favor, and I don't know if you can see this, but, but 
But this book, when people ask me for my testimony sometimes, it's really simple. I, I read this book and I believed it. I, I read the Bible and I believed it. And folks, if you read the Bible, it will change your life. Most Amen. people who are critical of the Bible, be honest, haven't read it. Yeah, Read it. You have all kinds of opinions about it, but have you actually read it? Well, something that I talked about on my last podcast is so many people rely on electronic media, and it's becoming more and more dangerous with the way that media and the big tech companies are actually controlling what is put out. And I've seen that firsthand as I was starting to become shadow banned on Facebook about two years ago. So I spent a year off of it just because I was trying to kind of detox. And then God continued to put this into my heart and my life about sharing the creation ministry, sharing the gospel through that. And part of it is we have to, we have to take advantage of it while we still have access. But it's also, too, is making sure people, when they realize, like when I talk with my young people, I say, you need to get as many printed sources of information as you can so that in the future, if somebody decides that something is hate speech and they decide to change the wording, for example, our Constitution, which we hear politicians always talking about changing, saying we need it was it was written with the intent to amend. Well, that is true. But. Will it be helpful to the, the, the vast majority of people in the country if we take certain rights away from people and then we eventually become like some of the countries that are experiencing the tyrannical threats that we see? So not trying to beleaguer a point that's not focused on what we're doing, but I want to make sure people understand the same thing. When I talk with my students in biology and we discuss chromosomes as we're doing right now in genetics and heredity, I want to make sure they see a very practical point that when these issues do come up about either abortion or somebody has something, you know, question about transgenderism or something like that, that Christians are able to defend their position. And again, some people have taken that as hate speech. They've taken it as yeah. well, you know, this person thinks they're better than me. No, whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian, we need to learn how to not only think more logically, yeah. we need to be able to communicate that. And unfortunately, a lot of Christians just say, well, I'm going to believe in Jesus. That's all I'm going to go with is just Jesus. But they, they're not prepared to answer certain questions. And yeah. again, I'm with you. There are issues that I do feel like need to be won, but I think, you, I think you hit it right on the head. The first and foremost issue every single one of us need to address is who is Jesus? Because yeah. if, he, if he's like anybody else, then there are multiple pathways to get to heaven. But if yeah. John 14, 6 and other passages are actually true, he is the way, and that's the focus that we need to keep. The way, the truth, and the light. No one gets a father except through him, yeah. except through I, me. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know what you mean. And um, I yeah. just, again, I think that, I don't think we need to forget about that. So, um, brother, let me just tell you something. I have truly enjoyed the time that we've had. I could talk to you all day. I, I'm actually surprised we didn't talk about baseball um, <laughs> or, uh, or, or me try to get a little bit more educated on mechanical things because you, uh, in addition to being a great Bible teacher, uh, you and I both have passions for baseball, but you're also a top-notch mechanic. So I don't know about uh, top-notch. I mean, I, 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 can, uh, I can fix uh, stuff, but um, top-notch I think would be, uh, be a stretch. <laughs> well, I'm going to put the my, pitch in. I, I'm going to put my brother. They, they, they are. I'm, I'm, I'm an amateur, but I try. Yeah. And again, there's that humility. So, uh, brother, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I look forward to having you on again sometime. If you'll have awesome. us, awesome. if you, if you'll join us again. And, yeah, uh, all right, Mike. Well, listen, I appreciate it. Hang in there and, uh, we'll talk with you soon. Thank you, brother.